welcome everyone. Thank you for participating. I think we can start. It's five o'clock now. So as said, you will receive a video afterwards. Don't worry. If you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. We will answer them after the talk. If you have sound problems or connection issues, don't worry. As said, you will get a video of the webinar afterwards. If you have then questions, just contact us by mail, by phone, whatever. So I think I can start now. So again, welcome everyone. Today's topic is about the dilatometer and uh, our product range regarding the dilatometer here at Linsize. Before I go into the details, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Sebastian Seibt. I'm head of laboratory here at Linsize in Germany. I'm a chemist. I joined Linsize in 2013, coming from organic chemistry. And I'm now mainly responsible for lab measurements, test measurements, customer service measurements, uh, mainly for the instruments uh, of classical thermal analyzers like DSC, TGA, dilatometers. And besides that, I'm also doing a lot of uh, yeah, customer consulting uh, in front of a purchase and so on. If you want to get in touch with me directly, uh, you can contact me under the email address down here uh, or by phone or if you just get in touch with the company. For those of you who do not know the company already, so uh, we are the Linsize Messgeräte or Linsize Thermal Analysis. Uh, we were founded in Germany, in Bavaria, in 1956 by Mr. Maximilian Linsize, the guy on the picture up left. Um, he founded us in a yeah, little town here where a lot of porcelain industry was placed and located in that time. And in the meantime, the porcelain industry is gone. However, the special company, special uh, manufacturing of car parts, special machines, lab equipment is left over, and so are we. Um, meanwhile, Mr. Klaus Linseis is our, the owner of our company, but he's more or less retired, and his two sons, Florian Linseis and Vincent Linseis, are the two who are our CEOs and are in the lead of the company now. Our manufacturing takes place here in Selb and Bavaria all the time, so everything we manufacture is manufactured here in Germany. Uh, beside that, we have facilities in the US and China where we have uh, repair offices, uh, sales uh, yeah, offices, where we have technicians and uh, distributors uh, that yeah, cover the North American and Asian market. And besides that, we have contract traders, about 65 traders all over the world. So in almost every corner of the world, there is a, a guy who represents us quite well that you can get in touch with no matter where you are. Our main business area is the manufacturing of yeah, thermal analysis equipment, the yeah, manufacturing or production of thermal analysis instruments and thermal conductivity and thermal electric analyzers. And besides that, of course, we offer uh, in a yeah, more decent amount uh, measurements, so service measurements in the lab where I'm responsible for. The product range I just mentioned covers the classic thermal analysis from DSC over thermogravimetric analyzers, uh, dilatometers, and then also thermomechanical analyzers uh, up to thermal conductivity instruments like heat flow meters, laser flash techniques, hot wire techniques. And then we have analyzers for thermoelectrics for analyzing Hall effect, Seebeck effect, charge carrier concentration, and so on. And in the most recent past, we focused a little bit more on thin films, the properties of thin films like um, yeah, also conductivity, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity of thin films and layers because of uh, yeah, a lot of industrialization is moving down to micro and nanotechnology where chip design and the properties of chip layers are of interest and therefore also the lab equipment must address these issues and therefore we are focusing a little bit about thin films and yeah, semiconductors in the most recent past. And besides that, we do a lot of customizations. That's what Linsize uh, stands for, more or less, in the market. We are doing uh, high-pressure instruments. So all these from-the-shelf machines can be also equipped with high-pressure furnaces. They are available as special versions for nuclear applications, for hot cells with separated electronics, for high-pressure applications, for ultra-high temperature applications, for low-temperature applications. That's what we mainly do, or what we, what we also focus a little bit on. And besides the customization of the instrument, we also offer coupling to various other techniques like MS, like FTAR, GCMS, and so on. So that's the range. And today's webinar, today's topic is focusing on the most yeah, classic and most simple technique in thermal analysis, the dilatometry. 
The dilatometry itself is a technique that was invented in the yeah around the Second World War and in the early early 50s. Um, it's more or less a method to monitor the expansion, so the thermal or temperature dependent expansion or shrinkage of any kind of material. You all know that a material that is, sees a heat change expands or shrinks depending on if it, the heat is going up or down. And the dilatometer is a technique to more or less monitor that quite accurately. The system itself uh, has yeah, developed since that time. However, the general technique is still the same. So the picture or the scheme here shows the general setup of a dilatometer, um, which consists of more or less a sample holder, a measurement system, and a furnace. The red part in here is the sample. That's usually, in ideal case, a rod or a rectangular rod. Uh, sometimes it's also just any kind of sample shape. And the sample is put into a sample holder that, that's symbolized by this tube here, by this white tube. Within there, within the tube, there is a push rod that's yeah, connected to the measurement system. And on the other hand, it touches the sample, usually with a defined force. And this push rod, of course, moves or is movable. And it moves when the sample expands or shrinks. Because of the force between the push rod and the sample is constant, the movement of the push rod can be monitored and gives an idea about the movement or the expansion or shrinkage of the sample. The measurement system detects that and gives you your data. And of course, the sample is yeah, more or less in a furnace or it's placed in a furnace that can heat or even cool the sample and therefore enables the customer, enables the user to uh, use a controlled temperature around the sample. So this is the general setup that has not very much been changing since the 1950s. Of course, the detection systems are improved now, the furnaces are improved and so on, but this is the general setup of any dilatometer. I say any dilatometer because the dilatometer range is quite big, and uh, that's the, what Linzeis can offer. So uh, our dilatometer range is covering a temperature range from minus 263 centigrade up to 2,800 centigrade. So that's the range where you can measure thermal expansion with our instruments. Mainly, we have, of course, we are focused on the off-the-shelf machines, the so-called L75 and L76 dilatometer series which can be set up in a horizontal setup or in a vertical setup, uh, which is more or less the same technique, the same instrument, with a little advantage and disadvantage depending on the direction I will show you later. However, that's the, the classic machine that can measure from minus 180 up to 2,800, depending on the furnace. And besides that, we have special versions like optical systems that do not have push rods that just detect the expansion by camera systems. Uh, we have uh, multiple push rod systems that can measure up to four samples at the same time uh, if high throughput is needed, for instance, for quality control and so on. We have special dilatometers for special fields of application, like the quenching and deformation dilatometer, so-called RITA for rapid inductive thermal analyzer, um, which is mainly designed for the steel industries and a very unique technique I will also show you later. Then we have pressurized floor-mounted systems that uh, are able to monitor the expansion and shrinkage of materials under high pressure levels up to several hundred bars. What's interesting if you do, or if you investigate sorption and desorption material of gases on materials like hydrogen uh, storage, carbon dioxide storage, and so on. So that's quite unique and quite customer, yeah, or customized and customer driven. And then we have uh, ultra accurate dilatometers. We have like the laser dilatometer, we have the ultra low temperature dilatometer for liquid helium applications I will show you. And that's that's the yeah, special kind of instruments. I will go on focusing first on the, on the classic machines. I already showed you how the system in general works on the first slide. Now I come to the details. Our standard machine, the so-called L75 dilatometer is a horizontal or vertical dilatometer that consists of exactly the parts that I have shown you in the first slide. So you have a detection system, a push rod that uh, goes through a cooled flange into a furnace that create, uh, controls the sample temperature. We offer that vertical and horizontal for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have to know in horizontal setup, you can run one or two samples at the same time. So there's a one push rod system and the two push rod system available. Um, of course, with automatic pressure adjustment, and that's the most simple configuration and setup you can have. 
Of course, you can evacuate the system, you can add on gas control and so on. And the same for the vertical system. At the first look, the difference is in the vertical system can be equipped with higher temperature furnaces. So the horizontal one goes up to 1600 centigrade, the vertical one even higher to 2800. And the vertical one can be equipped up to four push rods in contact to the horizontal one that can be equipped with up to two push rods. The automatic contact pressure adjustment is, of course, the same. What's the difference? Um, I said there are a little advantage and disadvantage advantages between those two setups. Um, so for beginning with the horizontal one, the horizontal one is quite easy to handle. On the left picture, you see a double uh, push rod system of a horizontal setup. That's two push rods where you can insert a sample over here, just putting in from the top, laying it into this tube. Uh, in this tube, then you attach the push rod and then you can measure, that's easy. Um, you can customize that for bigger and smaller samples, but in the end, it's quite easy. The vertical system looks like the horizontal one. The only difference is it's, it stands. And the, the real disadvantage of the horizontal system is if you have a sample that undergoes reactions that can affect your tube where the sample is put in. So if the sample is a green body for sintering or if the sample is highly reactive or the sample is even, there's a risk that it melts and so on, there is a certain risk that the sample will react with the tube and after the measurement, the sample could be baked to this tube. By using a vertical setup, the sample touches only the push rod and the end plate, but not necessarily the tube where it's placed in. So therefore you have less contact, less friction in case the sample is very inhomogeneous and less risk that the sample bakes to your system. So this is one of the advantages of the vertical system. However, it comes with the little drawback that sample handling in the vertical system is a little bit more difficult because the sample can fall down and has to be handled with care to be uh, yeah, put in properly. On the other hand, the vertical system is quite useful when it comes to ultra high temperatures or very low temperatures. I always say up to a range of 1,400, 1,200 centigrades, it doesn't matter. But going higher than 1,400, 1,200, something like that, going higher, you will get an effect caused by the convection within the system. Because heat trends to move upwards, you will have convection within the sample chamber. And in a horizontal setup, if you go to very high temperatures, the convection will cause disturbance on the accuracy uh, on the signal, and the, yeah, it will affect the accuracy of the measurement. In the vertical system, a measurement to high temperatures is much more accurate because the convection is lower. The control of the sample temperature is easier, and therefore we always recommend the vertical setup if you go to 1500, 1600, even 2000 and higher. The same for low temperature measurements. If you have a cooled furnace and want to go lower than minus 50, lower than minus 80, so lower than any intracooler or liquid cooler can reach, if you want to measure with liquid nitrogen, we recommend a vertical system furnace down and sensor upwards because there you have the same uh, thing. The convection causes the cold air to go downwards and to avoid too much disturbance and influence, we recommend the vertical setup with the furnace on, on the bottom side. Uh, if you go to really low temperatures. So that's 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 where the vertical system is better than the horizontal. As long as you stay in, a, I would say, common range, the only difference is that you have lesser friction for samples that are inhomogeneous or that I have a risk to bake to the tube. Another thing, uh, thing where you have differences is um, the detection system itself. A classic dilatometer like it was developed in the 15s uh, has an LVDT system, which is more or less an electric magnet that is mounted or in touch with the push rod and monitors the movement of the push rod and therefore gives you your signal. Usually we do it this way. You have a yeah, so-called LVDT system consisting of a primary and two secondary magnetic coils. Inside there is a movable core of the magnetic uh, setup. This core is connected to the push rod. If the push rod moves due to the expansion and shrinkage of the sample, this core moves within that coils. Out of that, you will get an electrical signal. This electrical signal is directly giving you the expansion and also the direction of the expansion or shrinkage. The resolution goes down to several nanometers. So to be honest, you can measure a change of, I would say, 20 to 30 nanometers in length. Below that, you are already in the noise level. The digital resolution is even 
lower, way lower. However, it doesn't make sense. If you have 0, 0.00 something nanometers, that's what a digital resolution provides. However, it realistic is you can measure 20, 30 nanometers change in length. That, that's what you can do. Um, and that's because it's a magnetic setup and it's an electrical signal that's transferred into a length change. Besides the LVDT, there's also the possibility to use a linear optical encoder. Here, you have a light source that is going through a condenser on the face plate and hits this kind of stripe here. This stripe is a black-white stripe that is yeah, transparent for light and the black parts are not transparent for light. And they are yeah, connected to this actuator down here. So the black bar here is an actuator that's also connected with the push rod. So if the push rod moves, this white and black stripes are moving and you have a detector on that side detecting the light that comes through that whole setup. And due to the movement, the light that comes through changes, the detector sees a different signal. And out of the movement direction of this black and white stripes and out of the signal the detector can record, you also get an idea about the expansion and shrinkage that this push rod monitors. The resolution is nearly the same uh, like with the LVDT. So it in general doesn't matter which one of these two techniques you are using. They both, like the horizontal or vertical setup, come with some advantages and disadvantages. Um, the advantage of the LVDT is its robustness because it is not affected by atmosphere. It is not affected by dust, dirt, whatever. So it's quite robust and easy to handle, while the optical encoder is more sensitive to dirt in here. So if you have a sample that causes a lot of fumes and outgassings, you have to protect this. It's from time to time, you have to clean that. The LVDT is not, not there's no maintenance needed for the LVDT, so therefore that's robust. For the optical encoder, you have from time to time to send it to a yeah, clean room lab to be recalibrated, to be cleaned, which is yeah, sometimes annoying. Um, that's the drawback. However, the optical encoder comes with the advantage of providing a bigger range. The LVDT has a range of a couple of millimeters in each direction, so around about five millimeters expansion and shrinkage can be monitored. That's when the mag magnet here reaches the end of the magnetic coil. For the LVDT, this stripe can be as long as you want, so you can monitor much longer changes, longer changes, and much bigger samples without the need of yeah, any help or yeah, without the risk to get out of the range of the instrument. So that's the main difference. What we usually offer is a LVDT system because of its robustness, because of the low need of maintenance. And if somebody wants to have a L0 detection, automatic detection of the initial length of the sample, um, of course, the initial length of the sample is much bigger than the expansion of the sample. So if you want to monitor the initial length of the sample automatically, you can have a system with a small encoder system to monitor the L0. And then there's an LVDT to monitor the length change. Um, or you can have an LVDT system at all to monitor both L0 and the complete change or you can just have the LVDT without being able to detect the initial length of the sample in total automatically. So that's the difference of regarding the detector systems. Um, once the detector is fixed and you have decided if you have a vertical or horizontal setup, there are furthermore options and regarding the measurement system. So the sample holders that we use and the push rods that we use are usually made out of quartz or made out of ceramics. The quartz parts are quite useful because quartz is a material with almost no own expansion. So for a quartz system, you almost can skip any kind of correction. You can use it as it is because it does not expand, except you, use some, uh, you have samples that have a very, very low level of own expansion. However, the quartz system is quite fine. For most applications, the only uh, disadvantage is the quartz is limited to around 1000 centigrades because higher than that, it bends over and gets soft or too soft or too viscous to, to be used anymore. So up to 1000 centigrades, we recommend quartz. Higher than that, we usually use ceramic systems. Uh, and when I speak about ceramics, I'm meaning uh, aluminum oxide or alumina with a little bit stabilizers in there. Um, we also can manufacture zirconia in case of alumina is reacting with samples. And of course, we have graphite systems for temperatures higher than 2000 centigrades. That's what we usually use. And all of these systems can be adjusted in size. As long as you have only one push rod in your system, 
The system can handle up to 20 millimeter diameter sample and all of our systems can handle up to 50 millimeter in length. The, the length is the axis that you measure. The diameter depends on the diameter of your sample holder. So there we are quite flexible. And in all of these sample holders, you then can additionally insert adapters for powders and liquids and so on. So that's what we have. I already mentioned that our furnaces are modular. So we are covering a range with the standard instruments from minus 180, which is liquid nitrogen temperature around about. So minus 196 is liquid nitrogen, but minus 180 is what you reach at the sample. From minus 180 up to 2000 and 2800 with the graphite furnace. So that's the range. In one run, you can cover minus 180 up to 1000 or room temperature up to 2800. If you want to go from minus 180 to the max, you need two furnaces or a system with at least two furnaces, um, because with one furnace, that's not possible. The type, uh, sorry, the, the temperature range that you want to use defines what kind of furnace you have to use. And the temperature range also defines what thermocouple you usually have at the sample. This letters here at the thermocouple are just defining what alloy they are usually made of. So for the low temperature range, we usually use type K thermocouples. Type K thermocouples are made out of nickel and they can sense temperatures up to minus 180, up to around 1000. Type K allows any kind of atmosphere. So the temperature range defines what thermocouple is usually used and that defines what atmosphere can be used for that kind of furnace usually. The heaters of each furnace are separated from the atmosphere inside, so therefore the heaters are not that critical, but the thermocouples. For the range up to 1600, we usually have type S or type B thermocouples that are made out of platinum, and they are also allowing any kind of atmosphere. However, with the platinum, you should not use hydrogen. Reducing is fine, but hydrogen is not good. If you want to use hydrogen, usually we have C-type. And in the graphite furnaces, you only can use C-type or pyrometers. C-type is made out of tungsten that allows up to 2000 centigrades. Higher than that is the graphite atmosphere. You have pyrometers that are lower in accuracy regarding the temperature measurement, just to mention that. So that's the possible furnace setup of the standard L75 systems. Besides that, I already mentioned that we have special dilatometers for special applications. Uh, I just want to introduce the, the special version dilatometers that we have and then show you some measurement examples. The first special dilatometer is the L74, the optical dilatometer. Please do not um, misunderstand that optical. We have the optical encoder as a detector for the classical pushrod dilatometer, but in that case, I mean real optical dilatometer. So there is no pushrod. There's just a sample holder rod with a plate where you can put a sample on top. And then there is no contact to the sample. So optical dilatometer and heating microscope means really contact-free measurement. So it means you place your sample on a disk and that's it. There is no contact to anything. Just It stands just on the disk that can be specified by the customer. So it can be ceramic, it can be metal, it can be whatever the customer wants. And then you have two options. On the one hand, really optical dilatometry. In that case, you have a camera you can see it on the, on the left side in the picture here, you have a camera system, you have a focus lens and the polarization filter. The camera lo looks through a little opening window in the, in the furnace flange. And on the other edge, uh, you have a light source. Usually we have a ultraviolet to, blow, uh, to blue light source that enlightens the sample from the backside and from the front side, the camera detects the edge of the sample. In the latometer mode, you really look at a small area of just some millimeters and you look at the very top edge of the sample. What we do is we place a reference material with exact known expansion next to the sample. And then the system or the software recognizes the edge of the sample, it recognizes the edge of the reference, and it monitors the movement of this edge of reference and sample over the yeah, temperature range that you use. And out of the reference with its known expansion, the, sample, uh, the software calculates the correction factor for the atmosphere and for the temperature range inside, corrects the sample automatically and monitors the expansion of the sample. And the resulting curve looks like a usually di a usual dilatometer curve. So you have just expansion versus temperature or expansion versus time, and that's it. The resolution of the optical dilatometry is limited by the optical wavelength. So 
when I was speaking about 20, 30 nanometer range or resolution of the classical push rod dilatometers with the magnetic detector system, here you, you reach around one or half a micron. So 500 nanometers, 0 0.5 micrometers is the limit. That's the limit of the wavelength of the, of the light we are using. And that's the limit of yeah, dilatation you can measure. The advantage is you can use very corrosive atmospheres. You can have contact-free measurements in case if you have sintering or expansion of very soft samples that would be influenced by contact through push rod. Here you can avoid that by having just a camera system without any need of touching or any need of contact. So that's where the optical dilatometer has an advantage. The temperature range, of course, is nearly the same like for the classical dilatometers. The only difference is we do not have graphite furnaces up to 2800, we reach 2400 here in the maximum, but the rest of the furnace program is more or less the same. The interesting thing is you can use the second option. The optical dilatometer can be used as a heating microscope. The difference is the camera setup is a little bit different. Uh, with the heating microscope, the field of view that you have gets bigger. So you now not, do not monitor only the, the edge even more. Now you have a full image of the sample, which is several centimeters in every direction. So X and Y axis are now several centimeters. And you do not longer monitor the exact expansion in, in microns. Now you monitor the shape of the sample. The heating microscope enables you to define exact yeah, melting effects like sphere point, half sphere point, melting point, flow point. And of course, it enables you to measure things like the contact angle, surface wetting, stuff like that. So you can get a temperature dependent contact angle. For instance, if you have paints, if you have some kind of coatings and you want to have several surfaces and test the contact angle, the wetting angle between surface and material, or you can check at the temperature, the surface is wetted ideally and so on. So the heating microscope is really something completely different. And with the one instrument, you can have two options within one instrument. So that's what the optical dilatometer usually does and can do. The next special dilatometer I already mentioned in the beginning is the deformation, so-called RETA or deformation dilatometer, um, which is very special and very unique. Uh, there are only two companies in the world who manufacture this. And this is really an instrument that's built according to an ASTM standard from the steel industries. Um, what it does is, instead of a furnace, you have a field generator that generates an inductive feed, field that's connected to an inductive coil. So you have a big copper coil on the image. You can see it more or less. So it's a huge coil around a sample. The sample is directly welded to the thermocouple. Otherwise, you cannot monitor the uh, temperature properly. And yet the sample is now heated by the inductive field. Of course, it only works if the sample is made out of steel, iron, or nickel. Otherwise, it won't work. And as I said, it's for steel alloys. The inductive coil can heat up the sample very fast, up to 400 centigrades per second. And the coil, the copper coil that is used for inductive field transfer, is also hollow. And there are little drilling holes in there that enables us to expand cold helium gas onto the sample directly, which allows also cooling speeds of several hundred centigrades per second. Being able to heat and cool the sample within seconds, um, you can create phase diagrams. So temperature transformation diagrams and controlled heating, controlled cooling diagrams. Um, that means you can heat up and cool on the sample in different speeds. And out of that, you can monitor phase transitions in the metal. Depending on the metal alloy composition, mainly in steels, you can heat and cool the sample, simulate forging process, and get an idea how fast you can heat and cool it to get yeah, very different, definite phase that should be um, yeah, achieved or should be reached because the phase uh, determines the, the hardness and the mechanical properties of the steel finally. The whole setup can also be equipped, like on the left picture, with an additional actor system. This actor can bring up to 25 kilonewton force onto the sample and applying 25 kilonewton force on the sample uh, really simulates a forging process. So you can deform the sample and get the rate of deformation during heating, during cooling, or at any given temperature. And out of that, you can simulate your forging process quite well. So this is a very special and very unique type of application. 
And last but not least, the third very yeah unique system is a cryodilatometer that is applying a liquid helium cryostat. So we have a closed loop liquid helium cooler here um, that enables us to run down to minus 269 centigrade, so down to four, down to five Kelvin. Um, this dilatometer were initially designed for the NASA and space agencies because they wanted to simulate the conditions out in space for satellite parts, for solar panels out at, that are mounted to satellites and so on. And therefore you have to reach that low temperatures. Uh, which can be reached by a liquid helium cryostat. Then we had another series of customers who bought that, who were doing uh, quantum computing, who were do, investigating superconductivities at that range, and then the expansion of that parts of this uh, computer parts that was also quite interesting. And that's also one of the very special systems that are quite unique. So that's more or less the dilatometer range Linsize offers. I will now show you some typical yeah, applications that we are usually investigating, and then we can have a little question and answer session. So the typical applications of the dilatometer, as I mentioned, are of course the thermal length change measurement of coefficient of thermal expansion, um, volumetric expansion, and of course sintering studies, so the behavior and the shrinkage monitoring during sintering. However, you can also get softening points, glass transitions, and monitor phase transitions by dilatometer. All the Materials that are shown here are typical or the most common applications. So ceramics is what we mainly measure regarding sintering. Metals is what we mainly measure regarding the exact expansion. And of course, we have polymers. We have different kind of composites. That's what we usually do. Yeah, and some, some typical applications. I just want to show you a, a little selection what we do. Um, this is a glass point determination or a softening point determination of glasses. If you expand the glass or if you heat up glasses, usually they show expansion behavior like that. You have more or less linear expansion until you come to the transformation point where the glass gets really soft. The most glasses show that so-called glass jump. So they, they start to expand before they start to more or less melt. Glasses are amorphous solid, so it's already considered as a molten state or as a more or less viscous state, but you really can reach the, the temperature when they get soft. So the softening point will be reached. And before that, you usually have an expansion. So that's how a glass expansion curve usually looks like. Our software can automatically detect shrinkage. That means if you have a sample that melts, the software can detect once the sample starts to shrink, once, once it starts to get soft, and can automatically stop the measurement at that point. On the right side, you see how the curve would look like in total. But instead of melting the sample in the instrument, you can just stop and skip the measurement after the maximum was reached and the sample starts to shrink automatically. So this is typical how a glass expansion curve looks like. Um, another feature that I can show you with that curve is um, our dilatometers are able to give you a kind of calculated DTA or calculated DC signal. Sometimes it's called calculated DC, which is wrong. It's more or less a calculated differential thermal analysis, so calculated DTA. That means um, out of the difference between real sample temperature and programmed set sample temperature, uh, you can calculate if there is an endothermic or exothermic effect taking place. If your sample undergoes a phase transition, undergoes any effect, and the expansion is not linear, and the expansion shows some effect, so the red curve is the expansion curve, um, you can calculate the difference between actual set sample temperature and reached sample temperature and see if the sample is hotter than it should be or colder than it should be. On this temperature differential curve, there can be peaks in the upwards or downwards direction. And out of the direction, you can get an idea if the effect you see is exothermic or endothermic. Not more than this. If you want to have more like a real energy amount or something, you should use a DEC instrument to get that. However, the dilatometer can add that function to give you an idea in what direction your energy goes, so endothermic or exothermic. That's what the dilatometers all can, can do, more or less. Another big field of applications is the sinter studies and sintering. So if you have raw ceramics, if you have raw brick materials and stuff like that, power metals and so on, these, these materials are usually manufactured by using raw materials, mixing them up, compressing them, and then you have a so-called green body. 
that consists of minerals of metals with some yeah materials like carbonates, hide uh, water um binders whatever usually you have a inorganic binder or organic binders in there to, to glue that all together and these materials are usually fire so they are brought up at a very temperature then all the water goes out and there sometimes or in most cases the reaction between the metals and the metal oxides in there takes place and you form one big metal oxide a mischievous oxide that's known as ceramic known as a brick or whatever and you lose a lot of matter in form of carbon dioxide, in form of sulfates, in form of nitrates, in form of water, whatever. That process usually comes with a huge loss in volume. And if you do not control your heating properly, you can have yeah, cuts in there. You can have uh, yeah, material failures in there. You can have uh, unfinished uh, or uncompleted synth behavior. And to avoid that, you have to study your material. And that is usually done by the alatometer. So usually you heat your material to different target temperatures. You see how fast is the material shrinking? Is the shrinkage finished or not? And at what temperature and what isothermal or plateau time is it finished and not? And this is just a typical sinter curve of a brick material. So you have a green body that is sintered. You heat it up. During heating, you see a first loss of volume at around 100 to 200 centigrade, which is the water that goes out. Then the volume or the, the length is more or less kept constant, a little bit expanding until really the sintering takes place. And depending on the heating rate, target temperature, and how long you keep it at the target temperature, the sintering goes on faster or lower with lower speed. And you see yeah, a loss of volume, a loss of length. And you can reach a plateau. So down here, you have the absolute value. So you can reach a plateau. Or you cannot reach a plateau. It depends on how long you keep it there, if the maximum temperature is enough or not, and so on. And once a plateau is reached, the reaction is over. You can cool on the sample. And during cooling, you see the normal linear shrinkage that any material shows when cooled down. During sintering, you can, of course, determine the coefficient of expansion, but it's in the huge negative range, of course. So it's not that much of interest. I just displayed it here to show you that's possible, even if it doesn't not make that much sense here. What's more interesting is the relative expansion levels, which is the signal that you get out of a sinter measurement. If you do that with multiple samples and multiple speeds and so on, you can create a master sintering curve uh, that predicts the ideal heating rate and the ideal target temperature for the yeah, corresponding sample type. So that's a yeah quite common application. The whole thing can also be done in hydrogen atmosphere. So instead of just air or in that atmosphere, there are some materials like powder metals or metals that are usually sintered in a reducing or even pure hydrogen atmosphere to get rid of the oxides in there. If you have metals and they should form an alloy or should react with each other, uh, oxygen is sometimes not so good because it causes the metals to form an oxide or metal oxide alloy, and you want to have the pure alloy without any oxid, uh, oxide in there. So therefore, hydrogen is a good atmosphere because it takes off all the oxygen, it reduces it to water and the water goes off and your pure metals are left over. So again, you have a temperature profile down here. So the sample is heated to a certain temperature and it's kept isothermal to get rid of all the water. Then it's the heating is going on to a target temperature until the sintering process is over, until a plateau is reached, and then the sample is just cooled down ballistically. And you see the yeah. Delta L, the red one is the absolute delta L. So you lost you lose some water in the very beginning, then you have expansion until you reach the sintering temperature, and then the sinter process goes on. You reach a plateau temperature-wise, the sinter process still goes on and reaches also a plateau where the reaction is over, and then you just cool it down. And this is what is typically done during sinter studies. Some special applications I want to show you as well. You can measure powder and liquid samples using a pushrod dilatometer by using special adapters. You have adapters for powders that are consisting of a yeah, hull with two small cylinders where you can press the powder in between. And then this whole setup is placed into the sample holder where usually a sample rod is placed. And then you can monitor the shrinkage or expansion of a powder and also the sintering of a powder. And there's also a container that has one pushrod and one fixed end that is used for liquids. In that case, uh, email raw mixture was measured. It was measured into the melt. During heating, it 
yeah lost some some humidity so it was already compressed during heating there was a constant force that's why the absolute expansion also relative expansion goes down all the time it was compressed even more the hotter it, it, got, it got and at around 520 centigrades the melt of the material just took place and that was when this uh, expansion curves uh, yeah, showed dramatically uh, yeah, shrinkage so that's just to show you that also powders and uh, liquids could be measured, enabling a just normal dilatometer. And then I have just some measurements to show you that we really can reach the 2,800 centigrade. So that's the measurement of a graphite furnace up to 2,800. What's uh, unique here is that you have pyrometers and no longer thermocouples. So the sample temperature is monitored by a pyrometer now. Uh, the pyrometer comes with the draw drawback that it measures the temperature quite accurate at the elevated temperatures when there's a lot of infrared irradiation coming from the sample. However, in the range where there's no infrared irradiation, so below 1000, below 500 especially, the temperature information is yeah, rather not there, not given. That's why the, the curve shows a very poor CTE, a very bad signal in the very beginning up to the first 500 centigrade. So then you have linear expansion from then on. Um, that's just to show you that if you use the 2,800 centigrade system, it's yeah, really configured for the high temperature. You can reach the high temperature. However, you have uh, uncertainties in the low temperature range, which should be covered with another setup, with another system, maybe with another furnace. And on the other edge, that's a measurement of the helium uh, cryostat dilatometer. So uh, that is just to show you that we reach cooling rates around 1 to 0.5 to 1 Kelvin per minute really down to 200 minus 260 centigrades and then we can heat in one run up to 180 200 centigrades so within one run you can go from room temperature down to 5 kelvin and then up to 180 190 200 centigrades that's what's possible with the ultra low dilatometer because these are the most yeah spectacular systems i i just wanted to show you the measurements how they look like and that it, this is all possible Finally, there's also an application for the RETA. So that's what I, I already mentioned uh, some slides before. With the inductive dilatometer, you usually under investigate phase transitions by heating and fast cooling. You get curves like on the left side. You heat up, then you have a phase transformation, and you cool down, and you have the back transformation. So the upper curve here is the heating. You, you, heat, you heat up. You see a change in expansion here, which is the phase transformation during heating, and then you cool down and uh, way lower than the upwards transformation, you reach the, the back transformation point. And the distance between transformation from one to the other and backwards, the distance between those two points may vary. If you do a lot of that experiments with different heating and cooling speeds, you get a 3D diagram. So you get something like this, depending on the heating and cooling speed, you get a zone or defined zone where the one or the other phase is stable and you get a shift of the phase transformation points that's depending on the speed. And out of this, you can characterize your steels, you can characterize your materials. That's what usually done with the so-called RETA or quenching dilatometers. So far about our dilatometer series and our special dilatometers, um, I'm finished with the talk now. Thank you so far for, the, for your attention.